Hebrews chapter 3, we'll read the entire chapter. And so, dear brothers and sisters who belong to God and are partners with those called to heaven, think carefully about this Jesus whom we declare to be God's messenger and high priest. For he was faithful to God who appointed him, just as Moses served faithfully when he was entrusted with God's entire house. But Jesus deserves far more glory than Moses, just as a person who builds a house deserves more praise than the house itself. For every house has a builder, but the one who built everything is God. Moses was certainly faithful in God's house as a servant. His work was an illustration of the truths God would reveal later. But Christ, as the Son, is in charge of God's entire house, and we are God's house, if we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in Christ. That is why the Spirit says, today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts, as Israel did when they rebelled, when they tested me in the wilderness. There your ancestors tested and tried my patience even though they saw my miracles for 40 years. I was angry, so I was angry with them. And I said, their hearts always turn away from me. They refuse to do what I tell them. So in my anger, I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest. Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving turning you away from the living God. You must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. For if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. Remember that it says today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. And who was it who rebelled against God, even though they heard his voice? Wasn't it the people Moses led out of Egypt? And who made God angry for 40 years? Wasn't it the people who sinned, whose corpses lay in the wilderness? And to whom was God speaking when he took an oath that they would never enter his rest? Wasn't it the people who disobeyed him? So we see that because of their unbelief, they were not able to enter his rest. As you can hopefully tell over our years together, I love God's word. It is filled with incredible teaching, instruction, beauty, and challenge, intrigue, and promise. It is the greatest story ever told with King Jesus as both the pinnacle and the center of it all at the same time. Even so, there are some passages in the scriptures that give me pause, that challenge me, that confuse me, and even some that rub me the wrong way. The Bible, depending on where you are reading, is brutally violent. It is deeply insightful, and it often flies in stark contrast to our modern Western thought processes and societal way of life, as you and I were discussing beforehand, Ron. Our scripture reading this morning is one of those passages. It is a call to the Lordship of Jesus which is not normal in our society. It is a warning against unbelief. It is an instruction for consistent encouragement among the believers to encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, and today is always today. So that means every day, encouraging one another. That's not normal. And it calls out sin for its deceitfulness 
And as that be as it being a source for separation from God. Sin is what separates us from a holy and pure God, and it calls it out. That's challenging stuff. And the question that I believe we are to wrestle with is, what are we to do with this conundrum? I love the word of God, and I hold it up as the word of truth, but I, I wrestle with it. I don't understand it all. I don't get it. I love it. I want to live by it, but it's hard. If we proclaim to love the Lord in his word, if we profess that Jesus is Lord and Savior, which means with, with the Lord, what the Lord says we do, what are we going to do with the more challenging and difficult passages found in Scripture? So by way of example, I'd like to take a look at one of the more famous passages of Scripture in the New Testament. It is found late in the Gospel of Matthew. And it is one that challenges me on a number of levels. It seemed to be a good place to launch from today. The very end of the book of Matthew, after the death, burial, and even the resurrection of Jesus. So we are way into the story now. In chapter 28, the disciples are given a charge. And this charge is proverbially, pro proverbially touted as the Great Commission. It's the heading in most Bibles. That's not written into the scriptures, but that's what everybody tends to call it. The Great Commission. Just the, the label right there should tell you something. It's pretty important. It is quoted by evangelists, missionaries, preachers, and other church leaders, likely as much as any other passage, because it is seen as the source code for the modern church. It's why the church exists. It's because of this passage that the church exists. To date, we have an incredible story. All the entire Old Testament, now we're getting into the New Testament. It's great, amazing context, but now we're getting a commission, a charge, a vision, a direction, something to do. A distinct instruction by Jesus himself. In Matthew 28, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him post-resurrection, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth. What other authority is there? All authority has been given to me. Therefore, go. And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In some circles, what I'm about to say to you would be considered heresy or sacrilege. But I wrestle with that passage. What am I to do with that? The foundational passage for the entire church as we know it, that is taken for granted by most anybody that's in my position, and I wrestle with it. What am I supposed to do with that? What does it mean to go? I have no desire or compulsion to go to all nations. I don't have that missionary drive. 
I don't want to go to Czechoslovakia or Africa or South America. I don't want to go to Chicago. What does Jesus mean by the term make disciples? How does one make another person into something that they are not? Particularly if they don't want to be made into something. How am I supposed to do that? And to obey everything, obey is bad, uh, tough enough. But to obey everything that you've commanded Jesus? We only have what somebody chose to wrote, write down in scripture. And that's, that's quite a bit in itself. But I wasn't around like the disciples were. I didn't hear everything he said. And what rises to the level of command? Teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. I haven't read a whole lot in the passage in the scripture that says, Jesus said, I command you to X. So, so what am I supposed to do with that? And what about that stuff that wasn't written down? And I, am I still held accountable to that? What, what? Which brings me to another big challenge in this passage. The fact that I didn't hear it all, but the disciples did. Jesus was directly speaking in this passage to 11 disciples. It says right at the beginning, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee. Judas was gone by now. They hadn't picked his replacement. So Jesus was talking to those 11 guys. And the rest of the New Testament is the story of how those 11 guys and the people they brought around them worked to fulfill that great commission. They went into all nations. They taught. Was he even talking to us? Was he talking to me? Was he talking to you? Was he calling every believer from that day forward to leave their homeland and to charge into the mission field? Is that what that passage is saying? Is everyone supposed to go to all nations and baptize them and teach them to do everything? Is that the charge there? The great commission? Like I said, there are people that do what I do that would consider what I just said in the last five to ten minutes is sacrilege or heresy. And I'm not trying to spread doubt. I'm just being honest with you. I wrestle with this. Because most would say, most in my position, would say, of course, yes, absolutely. How could you read that any other way? It's the great mission. Their confidence can be overwhelming at times and condescending at the same time. And still I ask, what am I to do with that? What are you to do with that? This week I have a couple of suggestions on how to wrestle with the tough stuff in Scripture. And next week, I want to get into some practical application of how to live that out in the world. But today I just want to get into our heart and our mind with how to wrestle with the tough stuff. The first suggestion I would have for us is that we don't dismiss it. It's real easy to read through God's word and to read something we would agree with and say, yes, I love it. And then we read something we don't agree with and say, oh, that doesn't work. And just dismiss it, ignore it, act like it's not there. And I would encourage us to not do that. That's not the answer. The answer isn't to pick and choose our, our channel of lordship. At the same time, don't dilute it. Don't water it down. 
don't just say, oh, I'm going I'm to look at this in a way that just allows it to be less impactful on my heart. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to accept it, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold it real close. I'm just going to, that's not really what that means. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to dilute it a little bit. And I would encourage us to not do that. Don't dismiss it and don't dilute it. Because we don't fully understand it yet. And the third one would be what, where I think that we have to be careful with the, the example passage today is don't doctrinalize it. And what I mean by that is if we are not to a place of really deep understanding yet, be very careful about attempting to impose it onto other people as a doctrine. You may have a deep conviction. You may feel like you've got a good understanding. God may be working his spirit in and through you on something, but be careful of the difficult passages and turning them into some sort of dogmatic doctrine that now you think applies to everybody because it might not. I'm not saying it does. I'm not saying it doesn't. I'm just saying be careful of that. I've been a part of groups in my past. I've been dialogue even to this day with certain people that have such firm convictions about X, Y, or Z. And I know people that love the Lord just as much, if not more, and have been following him for longer that don't believe in X, Y, and Z. Be careful of doctrinalizing, particularly, oh, by the way, that's not a word making into doctrine, <laughs> particularly the difficult stuff. Again, all the, the pastoral uh, blessing of allow God's spirit to convict you, allow for there to be confidence in your faith. Yes, just beware of turning it into doctrine that you think everybody has to believe just like you do because that can be a difficult place so don't dismiss it don't dilute it don't doctrinalize it but on the more positive side i would encourage us to admit it to be real about our doubt and confusion to wrestle to be willing to wrestle with it Because there's a lot of trust in that approach. I don't get it. I don't understand it. But God, I want to trust you. I believe in you. I believe in your word. There's a lot of humility that comes in admitting that we don't understand it all. The library of things we don't understand is much much, much bigger than the library of things we do understand in all of the world, in all of life. And the Bible is no different. So let's have some humility and be okay with admitting we don't know it all. And there are passages in scripture I don't have a clue about. Likely you can say the same. So just admit it. I wrestle with it. Secondly, I would encourage us to marinate in it. Now, this is grilling season. We know what marination is all about, right? Put all those spices and seasonings in the bag. You put the chicken in the bag. You put the steak in the bag. You put whatever in the bag. You let it marinate over time. Longer, the better in most cases, right? The same thing can happen in our wrestling with Scripture. Just marinate in it. Read it over and over and over again. Don't just read the verse. Expand to the chapter. Then maybe expand to the book. Read it in its context. I tell you, I've been, for a while now, I've just been reading chronologically through the word. Now get through the New Testament, come back and start at the Old Testament. I'm in First Kings right now. And just re reading, the God reading God's word in its context, is incredibly insightful. 
When you take one verse out of the book of Romans and you try to doctrinalize it, it's a whole different verse when you put it in the context of the conversation it's in and then of the entire book it's in and the purpose that that book was written. Everything starts to get dated in and, and shifting in our understanding of what it is. So marinate in it. Take your time. Don't try to jump to conclusions. Don't try to figure it out right away. Just, I mean, as, I'm, as I work with, whether it be my daughter or the people that are my clients, um, any, any, there are problems in this life. There are challenges that we face. And jumping to quick conclusions is not the answer necessarily. Sometimes we just need think time. We need process time. And the same is true in our wrestling with scripture. And then thirdly, talk about it. Talk about your doubts, your confusion, the stuff you're wrestling with. Now, admittedly, you, you want to be in a relatively safe space for that. Talking with God seems to be easy, but even then you're like, man, poof. He's the one that wrote it. <laughs> um, and definitely we want the spirit to be flowing in and through of us, us and helping us with our understanding. But there is incredible value in talking to someone else about it. It doesn't have to be an expert. It can just be getting another perspective. It can just be somebody asking you questions to cause you to think about things from a different perspective on a particular passage. I would even cautious you, caution us, if, if you're not in the room with a relative expert, to be wary of conclusions you might come to. Allow that to be a part of the marination process, but at least get you thinking in a different way. Again, in my work with my clients, this is one of the most powerful methodologies for learning and for growth and for uh, breakthrough moments, it's just asking good questions. So talk about it. There is a quote often attributed to Mark Twain. And it goes like this. It's not the parts of the Bible I don't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand. So that's a, that's a good place to start. Let's go to the ones that are pretty crystal clear. At least they seem to be. Now, before today, you might have thought that Matthew 28 was pretty crystal clear, but it's still not clear to me. But let's, let's, let's lean into the, the areas that are pretty clear, but then let's not be afraid of the parts we don't understand because, and I say this for myself, I can only assume it for the rest of humanity because I believe it to be true. Ignorance abounds. And I don't mean that as an insult. That goes back to the fact that the body of work that we don't know is much, much larger than the body of work that we do know. And let's not be afraid of our ignorance. But let's also not wallow in it. God's word can be challenging. It can be hard enough, again, to deal with those passages that do make sense to us. But even those parts of God's word can be so rich and so deep and so challenging that we don't want to simply take them for granted. Oh, I know that one. <laughs> no, spend time on that as well. We don't want to get stuck in the surface interpretation that we may have learned in Sunday school. Because it goes a lot deeper than that. There is so much more for us to learn, so much more that God may be trying to say to us. So again, I love God's word. And as we lean into it more and more, which is my prayer for everyone within the sound of my voice, may we never shy away from its truth. Don't dismiss it. Don't doc, uh, dilute it. Don't doctrinalize it necessarily, unnecessarily. But rather, let's admit to our ignorance Let's marinate in the things that we are trying to figure out. And let's talk about it with God and with one another. This is how we grow.
To God be the glory. Let's pray together. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, what a blessing this life is. We are just, we're on a navigation of a journey, an adventure. And Father, you have orchestrated the world that we live in. Your hand is upon us and around us and through us. But Father, in a sense, you've also turned us loose. You've given us free will. You've given us a bit of autonomy. And sometimes we spoil that, probably more often than not. God, would you open our eyes, our hearts, and our minds to the promise that you have for us? Should we trust you more? Should we follow you more? Should we engage with your word more and more? You have blessed us in so many ways. You have given us vision. You have given us insight. You have given us wisdom. You have given us each other. You have given us your word. You have given us your spirit. You've given us forgiveness of sins and grace and mercy and humility and so many things, Father, that are foreign to many in this world. May we never take that for granted. In fact, Father, may we embrace it and may we move forward in confidence and in your love. We love you. And we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, everybody, for being with us today. It's great to see you again. Blessings to you. Enjoy this gorgeous day. Pray for rain. We could really use it. Uh, blessings to you all. See you next week.